Obviously, you're very famous amongst all of the Scott Gemmas, really very flattering. <laughs> Better or for worse, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and I'm just wondering if people didn't know you, could you tell us a little bit about your career, maybe starting us when you were a physician? Okay, let's go right back to Aberdeen Medical School. I qualified in medicine in 1975. Mm -hmm and worked for only four years, Molly. That's all, only four years doing medical things. And dare I say, for me, that was enough. Yeah. And I may enlarge on why it was enough, or I may not. But I did do um, what were now considered the equivalent of FY1 and FY2, and I thought I wanted a surgical career. And that, I think, is mistake number one. You don't think you want a surgical career. You either do or you don't. And so my, my feelings, quite honestly, were misguided. But you have come across the anatomy demonstrators. You know that a lot of them are surgeons in training, surgeons in the making. So that was what I did. I moved sideways and became an anatomy demonstrator with that thought of, I may like teaching anatomy, I may miss the clinical side of things and firm up and try then to progress as a surgeon. So what was it like when you first started as a physician? It's a strange, strange situation. You are part of a team, but you're no longer a student. All of a sudden, you're there. And you're often in that FY1, FY2 situation, you're number one on the scene. So, responsibility, a massive, massive responsibility. So, it's exciting and it's fulfilling and it's tiring and it's terrifying. Mm -hmm. Absolutely terrifying. For some people more than others, I think I found it more frightening. I certainly had lots of pals, lots of colleagues who were loving the buzz of helping people, working as a doctor, being there first, putting into practice all the things they've been learning. They got a real buzz out of it. For me, I have to say, it was a struggle. Okay, so you said that you'd like to move on to anatomy teaching when you're a demonstrator. And um, what prompted that little change of the Well, this it comes back to the idea of being an anatomy demonstrator as part of a surgical training. And within a month, I found that I was more intent on getting the anatomy books out and learning the subject. So like our anatomy demonstrators here, I was much more involved in the dissecting room and also providing small group tutorials. And I reached a point where I was very, very keen to get to grips with the subject and prepare thorough teaching for the students. Now I'm using the word teaching deliberately. Mm -hmm. Because there we were back in 1975, there had been no tomorrow's doctors from the General Medical Council. And we thought that teaching was a case of telling the students what you'd learned and what you knew, just repeat it. Yes. And that was teaching. Oh, how flawed that perception is. So there was a joy in that, but in the early days, I just found was really enjoying getting to grips with anatomy as a subject and working with the students and passing that on. Did you find it more fascinating when you were working in it than when you were a student? I did. I did. I must admit, in Aberdeen in those days, the dissecting room was a two-minute walk from the snooker room. I will admit, I spent many hours in the snooker room. Not particularly successfully, but I, but I did. So I have to admit there was no guiding light anatomically uh, when I was a student. It was later on that it came, much later. Perhaps you can help hone in your hand like water. Well, you, you, you never know. <laughs> How have you found that teaching Scott Gem students out of all the people you've spoken to and taught in your life? No. 
all of the changes since tomorrow's doctors and what I said a moment ago about teaching being to uh, stand up, spout out the words and hope that some of it sticks. Essentially, tomorrow's doctors, back in 1993, a long time ago, realized that sitting passively in a lecture theater, listening to somebody like me, was not good education. It's not a good way of learning. So the, the term facilitating learning came. Well, of course, we all laughed at it. You know, well, I did not want to be learning facilitator. But after a short period of time, I began to realize what it meant. So the whole idea of, it was called student-directed learning, and I like to change that around and call it directed student learning so that you're dealing with smaller groups of people, interacting, involved with them. They can ask questions, you can respond accordingly. I would say that I have been trying to do that on and off since 1993. Working with Scott Jen, I was going to say it's the first time I've done it. It's the second time I've done it actually, but it's the first time where I feel it's been done successfully. I need to, I should ask you two whether you feel it's been done successfully. But for, for me, working with Scott Jim was able to put in place directed student learning. Now then when we come back to the small groups, you think of how we worked in the dissecting room. We had small groups, we had a number of us, I was only one of them, a number of people that you could then talk to and ask questions. And a lot of the time, it was overwhelming. We were trying to cover a huge amount of material. And often, with some embarrassment, to me, I remember standing there and saying, guys, we haven't got time to do all that. Well, you're going to need to look at this on your own and work with it and backtrack over it. So that side of it was different, a massive volume of content, anatomical content, but the method of doing it and the interaction with you, wonderful, absolutely wonderful. I think it has to be said, it's because you're a bit older, your experiences are wider, your knowledge base, hugely different. When you think of the number of colleagues of yours in the dissecting room and the different things that people have done, all feeding into the melting pot that we were having in the dissecting room. Oh, it was great, it was great, hugely stimulating, really good. Do you find it interesting to teach people with anatomy degrees, for example? Even better in a way, because I could look at them and sometimes I knew more than they did and sometimes they knew more than I did and it was rather nice to have people with anatomy degrees in the room because they could haul me up or they could, they, they could bring up difficult questions. It, so it was actually useful and, and sort of promoted the idea of interaction between students and staff. I hope it made the other students who didn't have anatomy degrees feel that they too could join in and ask questions. I hope so. these are the sort of things you don't really know when, when you're actually doing it. I suppose you've got to make the differentiation between the students that really have no idea, no basic biology knowledge, and then the anatomy students and still teach them anything that is clinically relevant in yes. the same amount of time. Yes. I, did, I, 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 I didn't. I, I, I didn't. That, if you like, is, is a possible flaw in the system. Unless you can depend on the anatomy students to almost do some of the teaching for you, which some of them definitely did. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, all of the students knew that they had others apart from the staff that they could talk to and, and ask questions. But there were certainly times that I was standing there thinking, right, I've clearly got some people in the group who know this mm -hmm. or are pretty certain of it and other people who haven't a clue what I'm talking about. And it isn't easy, it isn't easy for the students, and it certainly isn't easy as a member of staff, to actually draw that together. And then you sort of have to depend on students getting together later on outside the dissecting room and working with each other to fill the gaps, I, I think is the only way forward.
Well, with the successful results um, at the end of the year, I can't imagine how they're going to do it without you, but I do hear, I've heard several times that you're trying to retire. And how's that going for you? What are you looking forward to when you do eventually retire? Hey, Emily. Um, <laughs> the, it's difficult. I retired in 2017. We were having a house built, so we were living in a log cabin beside the house, and all the day was sort of distracted and disrupted by builders and things going on. All very exciting. But what can you do? There was nothing I could do. The whole idea was for Caroline, my wife, and I to go and play golf and go walking and do things. But we ended up going looking at bathroom suites and kitchen fittings. It, it was so time consuming that I ended up drifting. It was very, very strange. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. So when I got the phone call to come back here, I just said yes without even thinking about it. Because we were in a little log cabin, Caroline was in the room and she heard me say yes, but she didn't know who I was talking to. And people said to me afterwards, have you discussed this with Caroline? Well, not really, no. And obviously Caroline was perfectly happy for me to come back. Here I am back again, totally unexpectedly. Back again. And I'm not doing Scott yet. I'm having a nice time repeating tutorials I've done before, so it's nice and easy. I must admit, a year on, I, I've practiced a little bit more of retirement. The house is built. We've still got problems that are huge, stressful distractions. So it's not where I want to be, which is why I find it really difficult to answer the question about what are you going to do in retirement? And I'm afraid I've not made the bridge yet. I'm not there yet. And it's difficult. Should I be here? The answer is probably no, because I should be getting to grips with retirement. I should be making that transition and spending time at home, now that we've actually got a home to spend time with. Golf is the obvious one. Golf is a beast of a game. Don't ever, ever start playing golf unless you're good at it. All it does is destroy you. And the other things, the walking and all that, great, yes, go, go for that. But I'm struggling with retirement, I'm afraid. Well, the problem with being a doctor, you spend so much time working, but then you're a bit short of things to do in retirement. We'd love to keep you, of course, but equally, I think maybe God is calling. <laughs> it, must be, it must be. It must be. You're very flattering. <laughs> um, and just to round off, we've got new Scott Gem students that are coming out, and also current Scott Gem students carrying on with their anatomy and teaching. Have you got any advice you can give them? I've wondered about this, and it comes back to what I said earlier about arriving there with the responsibility as a doctor. It's you, you're in the front line, and it can be three o'clock in the morning, and you're totally on your own. You need to be prepared for that. And if I'm right, I think part of the Scott process was to take in graduates, have a faster track medically, in the hope that after graduation you'd be able to fill particularly rural placements. So you will be out there most definitely in the front and possibly even more on your own. So you need a really strong clinical and basic science background. I still believe that the clinical work is based within the basic science. But all I can say to you, take every opportunity you can to gain clinical experience. I cut corners. I've admitted going to the snooker room when I should have been dissecting. Well, I put that right many years later. But I cut corners when it came to clinical work and I paid the price. Try not to cut corners. It takes a huge amount of self-discipline and determination. Every opportunity you've got Go and see patients. Look at people who are poor. Look at people who are well, too. Work with experienced clinicians and build your clinical knowledge. While you're doing that, at the end of the day, if you're thinking, I saw a patient today and I, I wasn't too sure, go back to the books. Go back to your lecture materials. 
and certainly go back to the basic science. Revise the anatomy, revise the physiology. You can't look after a patient in renal without renal physiology. You can't look after a patient in intensive care without appropriate physiology. And you can't carry out a clinical examination without anatomy. I won't say any more, it'll become frightfully boring. <laughs> Get as much experience as you can, but it, it is self-discipline, really is. And then it's all worth it and quite enjoyable, really. Fantastic <laughs> gospel advice from Ian there. <laughs>